see deliverance take place, whether it's in video or whether it's in person. Jesus said it in his template prayer, deliver us from evil. Now at the meeting, you'll see people falling out. You'll see people weeping. You'll see demons manifesting. This is what God wants in order for you to be free. Yes, there's calm deliverances. People can be self-delivered within a matter of minutes by reading their Bible or a matter of hours or even a matter of months, however long it takes, however deep that demon is. We have a choice to make. Do we want deliverance or not? If we are full of pride, we will think someone else needs help, not us. But Jesus said, pick the plank out of our own eye before we pick the speck out of someone else's. So in these videos you're about to watch, we're going to focus on Matthew chapter 12, verse 29, when Jesus said, go after the strong man, go after the big demon instead of the little one. Why? Because cancer can come back. Uh, addictions can come back. And old habits can come back that we don't like. That's because the big demon is not gone yet. So Jesus tells us, go after the big demon and all the little ones will follow. Matthew chapter 12, 29. In that case, take a look at these and we go through every single strong man. There are 12 of them. Not 14, not 9, 12. Why? Jesus had 12 disciples. Satan must copy everything he does. Therefore, he has 12 strong men. And all these little demons are underneath the big guy. And the big guy is who you need to call out and tell him, get out in Jesus' name and take all your little demons with you. It works. Jesus would not tell us something that was a lie. So take a look at these videos. Learn and... Um, I have a... I have a uh, clipboard and a chalkboard and a um, place where everyone is writing down notes, things like that, please do the same. Take notes so you don't have to keep watching the video over and over and over again. Take notes so you can share it with your, your husband, your wife, your, your friend. Everyone in your family needs to know that deliverance is a part of salvation. We cannot make it to heaven without deliverance. So take a look at these and find the strong man that's been bothering you. Find the strong man that's been bothering your family and blocking your blessings and causing you trouble. And you tell him to get out. If you don't tell him to get out, no one else will. You need deliverance. And we, every one of us need to go through deliverance. And every one of us need to humble ourselves and say, I replace these foul spirits with the Holy Spirit. So take a look at this. With no further delay, the 12 strong men. Pick the one that you need and take care of them. Maybe you need five, maybe you need ten out of you. Doesn't matter. There's been people that have been delivered from 6,000 demons. Remember Jesus said that? The man said uh, that he had a legion inside him, a legion of 6,000 demons. So maybe you only have one or two. Tell them to get out. Oh, I don't have demons, really. The Bible says we were all born in sin. Sin means Satan. Satan has demons. That means we were all born with demons whether we like it or not. And it's our job to take a shower. We take a shower in the natural. We need to take a shower in the spirit. And when we take a shower in the spirit, those demons leave. Well, you have to put clothes on. Where do you put the clothes? Where's your clothes for your spirit man? The word of God. And those demons, when they see you read your Bible, they run, run, run. They wait for you not to read your Bible. They wait for you not to pray. And they come closer and closer. Tell them to get out of here. Leave me alone. And lastly, I want to say this. I teach in my classes, and you'll see it many, many, many times, the three things that it takes to keep the devil away from you, to stay delivered. Number one, read your Bible. Number two, obey it. And number three, walk away from sin. One time I was in a restaurant, and I saw a ginormous cockroach. Now, I'm in California. I love California. I hope I never leave California. But I used to live back east. And back east, we used to call these big bugs cockroaches. Well, out in California, they call them tree bugs. Well, I said, well, that's a cockroach. And that cockroach was crawling up this man's pair of jeans while he was eating. And I wanted to yell, hey, you have a pair of, you know, you have a bug, bug crawling up your, your pair of jeans there. The thing crawled so fast, it came up underneath the table and went right for his plate. And what did the guy do? 
Instead of running and screaming and calling for the manager of the restaurant, he simply took his left hand and threw it off the table, went over with his left foot and smashed it, sat back down and enjoyed the rest of his meal. That's what we need to do with temptation, with the devil, and with every strong man or demon that the devil throws at us. He's going to. That's his job. And if you're not getting mud thrown at you, you're not a sound Christian. So when you know you have offense, you're doing your job. So what you simply need to do is tell that temptation, get out of here. You smash it with what? Not your fist. The Word of God. Greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. On and on and on. You smash it and then you go back to enjoying life. Take Culture, if you will. Jesus was a Jew, whether people like it or not. And he had the Jewish bloodline spelled out in Matthew and in John. And it's not that the Jews are better. No. Just so that happens to be, that's what God is. So we like to follow what Jesus followed, whether Jew or Gentile. Because once you accept Jesus as the Son of God, he says, I adopt you into my family. And all the blessings of the Jews are now yours. An adopted child and a real child in the will get the same equality. They get the same amount of food at the table. They get the same bed, the same schooling. They're treated equal. And especially when you're dealing with God, who's a very fair God. Amen. So now, from Passover to Pentecost... We Jews, I happen to be a blood Jew. I didn't know it until about three years ago, and then I got so excited I wanted to study all the background of it and found out that's why they, there's, not, there's Judaism, which they do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they believe he's a good guy. By the way, we're watching from Buena Park, California. For those of you around the world or on Ustream, this is our deliverance class. And tonight we're going to be studying angels and demons. And we have several videos, all kinds of good videos to show how real angels really are and, of course, to show how real the demonic realm is, too. It's an equal. So uh, come back to class with us now and watch us every Thursday, and you can learn, too, by the grace of God. None of us knows it all. We are all constantly learning. And the Bible says, I'll take you from glory to glory to glory. No matter how old, how young, we always have more to learn. So from Passover to Pentecost, what happened is we Jews realize that the windows of heaven are open only during certain times. And those certain times are during the feasts, and there's seven of them. And we study that normally on Monday night, but the reason I'm bringing it up tonight is because we have a testimony. I have several more, but I want to share this is one tonight. During the times when the windows of heaven are open, miraculous happens. You end up with more money in your bank account than you expected. You end up with more favor than you expected. You end up with more positive happening to you than you realize. And it's because every time you spend a little bit of time with God, he pours down blessings on you. So the more time we Jews, we set everything aside. Because we know if we made, let's just give a guess, if we made $10,000 in one day, that's a lot of money. We can set that 10000 aside and put closed on our door. And we get alone with God and we speak the word of God and we pray. Because we know when we open it back up, we'll make 100000 That's how God works. When we set stuff aside for him and say, I don't care what, I'm going to set. This is the time when the windows of heaven are open and God is counting on me to communicate with him. So during that time was Passover, which... In, in America, in the Gregorian calendar, they have it Good Friday, which there's really no such thing as Good Friday. It's Good Wednesday. But anyway, Good Friday, and then we call the time when he was in hell for three days, so we don't have to go. That was called unleavened bread. And then when he rose from the grave, it was called first fruits, and they happen to call it Easter. So during these times, we just finished, and then they count, excuse me, as soon as they raise from the dead, then there's 50 days. To Pentecost, and Penta means five zero fifty, and that's when all the disciples, uh, Mary, uh, Jesus's mother, his brothers, one hundred and twenty in number, fit in the upper room. Has anyone been to Israel in the upper room? Okay, it's a small 
It's about the size of this area right here. And it has a little platform on it. And then it has one small area, a hallway, where they went down, and I'm sure they used the restroom down there, but they did not leave that place for 10 days. And they got used to everyone's B.O., their bad breath, and they got over all the petty junk in life. That's what God is waiting for all of us to do. Get over all the petty junk in life. Well, I don't like her. Well, I don't like him because get over it. People don't like you too. The point is this. Let's learn to love one another. Realize that none of us are perfect. Now, if we're purposely sinning, we have to go tell that person, listen, the Bible says, not me, the Bible says this, 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 and this. And you do. So now, the point is, during that time, I have been telling everybody, set things aside, read your Bible more, pray more, and ask for things that you never asked for before while the windows of heaven are open. And those requests will be put together. And at the right time, they'll be put on you. Well, tonight, we had Richard walk in. And he said, I got to show you a letter. And I'll just say, I'll just say it in, 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 in so many terms. Ter It's a simple letter, but it has a, a check on the bottom of it. Bonus check. $527. I got this for free. You know, like, See? I can, I, How's that work? Oh, oh, speak it into the microphone because that camera Oh, yeah. Right but, yeah. Okay, today, Richard went to work, and unexpectedly, he was not aware of it. During the Pentecost, pe pra this is what happens. Now, it could have happened next month. No, it happened now. Because this is how God works. You do things his way, not our way. And he came back with a check. And a letter that says, thank you. Your services are so wonderful. We decided to give you a bonus. Yeah, yeah it's a trip, how that works. But so he's so happy. You know, so show, I'm going to show I'm the blessed. camera. I'm blessed. Um, I'm going to show the camera. This is his bonus blessed. check. Yesterday was uh, like the, um, the last day when the window of heaven open, seven days. So I came to the, over here and I read Deuteronomy 21 to 13. <laughs> Right, and, and I almost what? forgot to do that, right? But I'm just saying that you got to remember, and God reminded me for some reason, Richard, and he been reminding me all day, but I keep forgetting, but I had time, I was sitting out right here, and I, oh, I probably go run over there and hit that, and I even borrowed someone's glasses because I can't quite see that wow. good. And, you know, and then I read it, but you got to stay faithful in your prayers and keep pressing in and don't give up no matter what. And, and then, and I also see my mom today, I haven't seen her for a long time, you know. And then I hugged her, you know, it was a great feeling, and wow. she's getting old, and uh, she's still healthy, and, uh, wow. you know, and I forgave her, you know, it took long, like 40 years, but I, I actually finally did that, you know, wow. all the child beatings she gave me, you know. Somebody clap for Jesus, amen. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Woohoo! So you actually had two blessings. He got to see his mother again, and there's the check. An extra, he wasn't even expecting it, y'all. Putting 600 bucks, just shy of 600 bucks in his pocket now. That's how God works. And what did you read? Deuteronomy? Can somebody tell me what Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 through 13 says? Can somebody tell me what Deuteronomy 28, 1 through... It talks all about your money, honey. Everybody needs it. God, not one problem on this earth isn't discussed in the word of God. So-and-so lied on you. So-and-so squealed on you. So-and-so hurt you without a cause. You need money. You need a car. You need a house. Everything is in the word of God. No, they didn't have cars back then. No, they had camels. They had cows. Every form of transportation, every form amount of money. They had it right here in the Word of God. So all you have to do is speak what the Bible says. You don't speak what a pastor says truthfully because we make mistakes too. But I rely on the Word of God. So if I need money, I go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 through 13, and you speak it for morning. Now he spoke it once. Let's just say he spoke it 10 times. That check would have been 10 times more. That's how God works. But look at God used his, him as an example to say, look, that guy, I remember during Passover, he came up here. He was the only one. Nobody was watching. I came in here early to set up. And I saw Richard up here taking this great big Bible. And he was starting to read, read, read. And he looked up. 
Oh, hi, Dr. Hope. And I, I was almost like a distraction to him. That's the way God wants it. We want, he wants a personal relationship with just you and him. Not look at what I did. No. So he was up here reading it. And he received another blessing. I'm telling you, you cannot go wrong by spending time with God. You give him five minutes, he'll give you five hours. Amen? Okay, we have a lot of fun video to watch tonight. We have both angelic videos of angels showing up. And I'll just use this as an example. There's one video I'm going to show you that these people, I don't remember who it was the other day. I talked with different people. But uh, someone had said to me, well, I really don't need a Bible because I have it on my phone. I said, well, that's good too. But what if your phone dies and uh, needs to be charged and you are really hurting? Oh, Lord. I'm telling you, even if you carry a little New Testament, God sees, and the devil does too. And that, this happens to be, this happens to be mine, and this water dripped on it. Forgive me. I've had, but I use this as my shield. So if I'm walking around, the devil sees light. Not from Dr. Hope, but from the word of God that I'm carrying. And you'll see this video. Every person happened to have a Bible on them. And because the Bible was on him, the bullet hit the Bible and didn't hit the heart. Because the Bible was sitting by the front door, the burglar went to the next house instead of this one. So always keep the word of God on your premises. You can carry it around. You can carry everything else. You can surely carry a Bible. That Bible is more important than your wallet. It's more important than your family. Because he'll keep your family together with that. It's more important than your purse your dress, and everything else. That word of God will bring everything. Look at Richard. Doesn't even expect it. He goes to work today and he gets a, a bonus check on the last day of Pentecost, June 7th. Let's get right to this. This is deliverance class in Buena Park, California. The supernatural is greater than the natural. If you all could have your eyes open and see how many angels are packed in this church right now. If you all could have your eyes open and see how many demons are walking around outside, you would say, wow. And you would ask God actually to take it away from you because it would be so distracting and so disturbing. This is why few people see it. There are so many angels and so many demons that we are a minority. However, there are more angels than demons. Isn't that a blessing? When Satan fell out of heaven, per, like he, he chose pride, and God just went beep, and he went right down. A third of the angels thought he was so beautiful that they went with him. But two-thirds are still in heaven. So these tonight, if you want to write these down, there are five level of, levels of angels, and they all have a job. The three bosses started out, they're called ark angels. One is the archangels. One is Michael. Michael is the warrior. Then there's Gabriel. Michael is the one that's going to take Satan's head at the end and stomp his foot on it. People don't play. When they fast and pray and they're in a battle, Michael shows up and the devil runs because he knows that's the strongest, mightiest angel. Then there's Gabriel, which happens to be the announcer. Gabriel was the one that appeared to Mary and said, Blessed art thou, woman. You shall have a child and you'll call his name Yeshua. Gabriel was the one that showed to the shepherds, came in a dream. Gabriel was the one that came to Joseph and said, move to Egypt. The Pharaoh wants to, excuse me, the Herod, the king wants to kill your boy. The announcer, the announcer, they're the bosses. Now, when bosses are bosses, they have little people underneath them, right? So they have little messenger angels, one assigned to every one of you underneath Gabriel. Warrior angels that will fight on your behalf under Michael. I mentioned this a little bit before, and I'll just review it again for the new people in the room. Your angel, when you pray, is sitting there right next to you. Standing there right next to you, lying there right next to you, whatever he wants to do. And he's monitoring you to make sure 
that you're okay. And if you speak anything from the word of God, he jumps. But if you just speak plain, whatever your language is, Swahili, Chinese, Spanish, English, then he just lays there with nothing to do, sits there with nothing to do. But the minute you say, here's my prayer request, Lord, and you said, ask and ye shall receive, then that angel actually has something to work with and passes it to the next angel who passes it to the next one. And it gets all the way up to heaven. Now, most of the time, prayers make it to heaven, and most of the time, God answers them. Most. He looks at the heart, the Bible says. If the prayer is a selfish prayer, if the prayer is a non, it has nothing to do with, like you say, I pray for money. And God knows if you pray for money, you do nothing but, you do nothing but you know, bless yourself with that. You wouldn't help anybody else. Psh, he knows the heart. But most real Christians that pray biblical prayers, we call them scriptural prayers, their prayer makes it to heaven. But this is where most of them stop. You need to get that prayer back down to your cell phone. You need to care, get that prayer back down to your email and get this thing answered. So how do you make sure your angel is equipped? You have to seal your prayer. And the Bible teaches us that there is angels and demons that fight constantly, constantly, constantly over your prayers. And if he can steal, if your angel is getting weak because there's no prayer, He's counting on you. You're, he's, you're the one paying him, for lack of a better terminology. How do you pay your angel? You speak Bible verses. And when you speak Bible verses, he pulls out his sword. And he cuts that demon off. Leave me alone. i got to come back down and deliver this prayer now. But if, you're, if you forget about the prayer, you get too busy to continue to speak God's word, that demon comes up and goes, oh, that's a weak angel. Their guy down there or that lady down there didn't continue to pray. I'm going to go steal that prayer request out of their hand and give it to one of my boys. Make one of my boys really rich and make it look like you don't have to make it to heaven. Everything's good right here on this earth. You know, the devil has to deceive, so he has to have a whole host of men and women that are all wealthy, that have it, that made it, that never read their Bible or pray every day. Where does that wealth come from? The prayers of the righteous that did not dress their angel or their prayer accordingly. I, I will show you a video of that very thing. An ex-Satanist came and said, listen, if you all knew, if you knew what we knew, and then he, he came out and said, you stupid Christians. He said, you start your prayer and you never finish it. He said, we count on you not to know how to pray. We count on you not reading your Bible. So we can steal the desires of your heart. For this man to come out of the Satanist church, by the way, he's had hit after hit after hit on his life because he's told so much truth. He said, if these Christians took time, this is why I tell you to read your Bible for five minutes every day. If they took time to read their Bible, them demons would run from them. And then he said, if they knew how to pray, when we pray, we seal our prayer with the word of God. And you said, ask and you shall receive. And then we add three things to equip our angel now to keep him strong. The blood of Jesus. I seal my prayer with the blood of Jesus. I seal my prayer with the fire of the Holy Ghost. And I seal my prayer and myself and everyone I prayed for in this prayer with the whole armor of God. Now your angel is dressed with the whole armor of God, has the fire of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus. Remember, he's your agent. Pay him well. Do it right so your prayer comes right down to your check just like he did. Had he not got up here and prayed several times and read his Bible when nobody else was, and he didn't say, look at me, God honored this man and said, look, I'm going to bless him. Watch, your next check will be triple. It's going to be triple. Watch, because he gets it. God bless him in front of everybody because he takes time to read his Bible. Okay. The archangels have little ones underneath them. The cherubim, that is found in Revelation chapter 4. 
They are the ones that go around the throne. The seraphim, excuse me, the seraphims go around the throne and around the throne and around the throne singing, holy, holy, holy. They protect our father. Protect him from what? If the devil can get into your business, he can penetrate heaven. This is why the living creatures are necessary. They stand at the door and they have six eyes. Imagine Ezekiel chapter one talks all about it. They have six eyes. They have four heads and six eyes. Say, excuse me. And they're constantly watching and the angels get out of here. Get out of here. This is heaven. And they've never been able to penetrate unless God allows one to walk in. And that was Satan himself in the book of Job when he walked in. He's pacing in front of God because he hates. He got fired. And he's trying to get back there to see what he can do to destroy God because God fired him. So he's pacing in front. And God says, hey, have you seen my servant Job? Otherwise, no devil can get in because there are so many angels protecting. If God needs angels, how much more do we? You see? That's his house. He's protecting your house, your future house. And God has all these angels to protect what he has because he knows there's a devil out there. And he knows their number is small compared to his. Small. Look at three levels of darkness, five levels of angels. You have so many more angels. We have so much on our side if we just pick up the tools and use them. Thank you, angels, for fighting on my behalf. I dress you with the whole armor of God, the blood of Jesus, and the fire of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now the cherubs. They're more angels. These have wings. These are the ones that you see. Some of them are big. Some of them are little. The living creatures are the ones that are in front of the throne. And like I mentioned, they have four heads. They have, a, they have an eagle on one side, an ox on another, a human on the other side, and an and a eagle, excuse me, an ox, an eagle. I think it's a horse. I'll, I'll have to look it up which one it is. But anyway, four heads. Um, an ox, an ox, a man's head, an eagle. I have to look it up. And they have six eyes. Can you imagine? The Bible says they're going like this constantly, looking around. And on their bottom, they, have, they don't have feet. They have wheels where they spin around, and they're constantly looking to defend what God has created in the heavens and simply to beat off the devil. Okay. The devil is like a spider that is walking along the floor. Where was I sitting the other day? some restaurant, and I saw this great big, what they call tree bug, it looked like a giant cockroach to me, come walking along, and it just walked right up the table, right up this guy's, right up this guy's legs, jumped on the table leg, and got right, and I was watching it, thinking, how long did that take? About 20 seconds for that thing to crawl up there, and then he finally went, hey, now that's what you need to do to the devil, He's creeping up there, crawling. Might take him 20 seconds. Hey, get out of here. Amen? Okay. So now, remember, we have five levels. The last one I want to talk to you about real quick, and this is the one you're going to see in the videos tonight, called Common Angels. They're found in Hebrew chapter 3, verse 2. It says, Beware, for you may have entertained angels unaware. They're, they look like human beings. There's one video which I'm going to bring next time, and it, and it shows this 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 man and a truck driver, uh, he's going across the bridge and he's a, he doesn't have a great big truck, but he's got a medium size, like a truck and he's going across the bridge. And as he goes across the bridge, here comes this little man doing his little fruit basket on wheels. You may have seen this on the internet and they come to the intersection at 4:30 in the morning at the same time. And the little guy, he's tired. This guy's tired and they should have smashed. But suddenly, a common angel showed up, and the street camera picked it up. No human got the glory. God alone got the glory. And the street angel had a hoodie, dressed in black. People say, oh, black, oh, please. We were created out of black dirt. Black literally means wealth and wisdom. Yes, white is purity, but the devil stole the rainbow. He stole black. He stole things away from God and manipulated them to make them sound bad. So this common angel was dressed with black jeans, a black hoodie, because he or she, whatever it was, wanted to give God the glory and not themselves. 
and they saw this accident happen. They were walking, and you can see their hands glowing. They went and they quickly grabbed that man out of his little stroller, picked up the stroller with one hand, brought it over here, and set it down. And then she was helping rearrange his, she or he, whatever it was, rearrange his fruit. And the camera shows the guy in the truck panicked because he saw the man cross right in front of him. And he gets out of the truck, and the camera shows him looking around. He's looking underneath his truck. What? What? And then he sees the man oh, on the side of the road. And the, and the angel immediately saw that the man saw them. And he quick made sure his hoodie and he walked away quickly. Angels from the Lord will never give themselves the glory. They will only give God the glory. They're only on assignment. Somebody was praying and maybe even praying in tongues and knew that accident was going to happen and that angel was dispatched immediately. How often have you all been out there to be able to sit in this place right now? How often have you all been out there and you needed some help and you actually got it? Because a common angel came along. You turned around and they were not there. She has, she has, you have. They've not been there. It's happened to me several times. And when I wasn't saved, I was like, what was that? And God was trying to get my attention. Come on, Gabrielle. There's a lot more than just you and all these people in this world. There's a supernatural world that you need to pay attention to. That's your future. Yes. Okay. truck didn't see me because I was behind the other car and it hit me and the guy the truck the truck bounced up in the air and the dude was looking at me talking Whoa. about if you hurt do you need to call the ambulance and I just walked across the <gasps> told him no okay. it was hurt but that was cheap. You gotta tell me. you gotta say this in the and microphone the guy, so they can hear it. He was walking across the street and a truck came yeah. and the Lord allowed the truck to go up in the air to miss him. Yeah. And the guy thought he hit him. The truck hit you. Yeah, hit Where? But it didn't hurt me. Oh, and it bounced up. And the truck driver was yelling every time about, do you need any help? And I told him, no, sir, I'm all right. He said, you sure? I said, yeah. And they was all, the traffic was looking at me like this. <laughs> and an angel showed up. Yeah. Wow, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for sparing Ed's life, for bringing his angel to defend him again when he was innocent. And thank you also for not, for not letting that truck driver get a hurt, you know, get. Wow. I bet you that truck. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I tell you, you know how you know certain people? This lady has a pure heart. You have a pure heart. This man wants to be clean as clean can be. He, he wouldn't, if, if he, once he's completely delivered, we all need deliverance. He, that man won't be able to tell a lie. You have a pure, pure, pure heart. And so do you. And young lady, she's, she's about to give her heart to Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm telling you, you can see, God bless you for being so poor. Hang on, hang on. Hun. Wow. Common angels are around, y'all. And this church is packed with them. The Lord just allowed me to see one one time standing back there. But I know there's many of them. Because every single one of you have it. Especially when you pray. Amen? Okay. Let me, let me get to this real quick. Okay. So before we... Five levels of angels. Don't think that, don't think that the demons can... Oh, there's too many demons. No, there's not. It's your job to smush on them. Three levels of heaven. Let me get to this real quick. Hang on. Let me get to this real quick. Okay. The first level of heaven. Can somebody tell me? Where the birds fly. I'm sorry, the third level. Well, I, I should have it actually backwards. Let me do this. Don't do that. Can I run on the I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. The first level, the second level, and the third level. The first level is where the birds fly and the airplanes fly. Second level is the planets. And the third level is where our Father and all of your Christian ancestors live. Amen. All the saints of old. Are in God's heaven. And, and, and John and Paul both said they went to the third heaven. Ezekiel was in the third heaven. So the first, and this. God, God, universe, and you there. Yep, exactly. Now, here's the interesting part God is a very fair God. It's a very fair God. Now, remember, He is not going to tell His precious little human beings that He created. 
to do something that he couldn't allow them and give them the equipment to do. He won't tell you to live holy if he didn't think you could. He wouldn't tell you to live righteous if he didn't think he, you could. He provided food. He provided fresh air. He provided. He provides everything physical and spiritual to make us holy to get back to him. We started and we go right back. Amen? So on that note, here is these two levels God gave to Satan. And he says, but I'm going to give my little people the energy. He said he is the prince of the air. He gave the devil, allowed him to be the prince of this air. That's why there's pollution. That's why there's airplanes flying into buildings. That's why there's all kinds of negative. The prince of the air. We have the power to overcome it. We say, you know what? That can happen over there. But around me, I have the blood of Jesus, the fire of the Holy Spirit, and the whole armor of God. So you're like in your own little bubble. Isn't that great? He's given us everything to overcome the enemy. And don't forget, you pray for your loved ones too. Then the second level, he tells you, don't mess with that. I already gave you your stars. Your stars will reflect the day you were born and all the Bible verses that go with your day to tell you your, your call and your plan in life. Everything will reflect back to the word of God. Jesus Christ and his word are one. If she wrote an autobiography and I wanted to know about her, I would go to her and say, do you have your book for sale? I like her personality. I want to find out what she's been through. I would read her book. She'd be out there talking. I'd be reading her book. Wow. And then I'd come back and I'd look and I now I understand her better. That's how it is with Jesus. This is his autobiography and biography. And it's true. It may not make sense because it's written, because we understand it in the Western culture. But when you read in the Eastern culture, it makes a lot more sense. So if you ever come along a Bible verse or if you ever hear people that blaspheme and say the Bible contradicts itself, it shows their spiritual ignorance that they never studied beyond American culture. They're limited. You study it in Hebrew, you study it in Arabic, excuse me, in Greek, the whole Bible makes sense. Do you remember the Bible verse where it says, and I'll briefly say this, it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to make it into heaven. At the time that I read that, the very first time that I read that, I threw my Bible across the room in arrogance because I had four fancy cars, I had four houses, and I thought my poo-poo didn't stink. And I wanted to make it to heaven. I can make it to heaven. Nye, nye, nye. I thought I was all this and that, and I had a lot of money. So I was frustrated. So I ended up going to Israel to find out what's the eye of a needle. I know a camel, so I went for a camel ride. Now, how can this camel go for the eye of a needle? And then I found out, duh, Gabrielle. Back then, they didn't have the internet access like they do today. The needle is the gate around the city, and the eye is the arch opening. The camel just has to get everything off its back and crawl through. So it's possible. It just takes a little effort. It's possible to make it to heaven. It just takes a little effort. Amen? Okay. So now, remember, that then the third level, we just need to pass through. Don't worry about what planet is doing what that depends on who you marry. That's all a lie from the pit of hell. I can't stand you psychics and you palm readers and you mediums that you lie to these good people and you destroy their life and you tell them that they're supposed to marry this person and that person and you have nothing to do with the word of God. Your end is the pit of hell. You re need to repent quickly because all the people that you infiltrated, their blood is on your hands. You need to repent and read the word of God. All they are is a counterfeit for the word of God. The Holy Spirit will tell us prophets what's going to happen here, 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 here. They tell us the past, the present, and the future. That's what pastors, prophets, and teachers are all about. So the devil has to come up with his and have people go. Good people go to psychics and palm readers. and It's a, it's a junk. A Ouija boards. It puts a instant automatic curse on your life. Don't allow it. And if you've ever been to one innocently, you didn't know, you say, Father, I cancel every curse that that witch, that psychic with a smile on her face, or that medium with a male, on, the male had a smile on his face. I, I don't care what they said to me. I don't care if it made sense. They're always going to know the past. But they can only guess at your future. The reason they know the past is because everything you've said and done is written in the archives of heaven and it passes through them so they know 
So the demons will tell him, tell him this, tell him this. Ignore it. Only listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and get that curse off your back. Okay. So we have the three levels of heaven. This is where we need to end up. The third level with God. I've listened to too many good people. Their lives have been destroyed. One of them is up in Lancaster. Precious, beautiful lady. Has three, two boys and a girl. Three children. And about 10 years ago, someone introduced her at her work. This psychic lady that came in and said, Oh, oh, here. And she first offered her a drink. And the lady didn't know to apply the blood of Jesus over the drink. The lady ate the drink, and, or drank the drink. And as soon as she drank the drink from a psychic, the demon entered. That's what the Bible says. Pray over everything you put in your mouth. Everything you touch, even the clothes you put on your body. All you have to simply say is, I apply the blood of Jesus over this. And then eat it. And any foul negative that had planned to destroy you on your body or in your body is dismissed because the blood purifies everything. Now, uh, this lady foolishly went to the psychic and, oh, she loved it so much because she was so right on that she took her children. Read, read, tell them what there is. I want to know foolishly. And as soon as that happened, her marriage fell apart. The one kid, she walked into the garage and he was hanging himself in the garage. Suicide, too late to bring him back to life. The other kid went schizo. And the girl married a man that beats her up. But everything was great before then. So those stinking psychics are sent by God to destroy good people's lives and strip them of everything. They're alive from the pit of hell. Now we go to this. The three levels, we've already discussed the three levels of darkness. Satan is the head. The strong men, there's 12 of those. And then the hundreds of thousands of little demons, which still are small in number compared to all these angels. Amen. And I'm going to give you the, next, the levels of hell next time. But I wanted you to watch some of the common angel videos. And when we're watching, done watching all the angels that showed up to help accident after accident after accident, it's amazing. These videos, it's just amazing how they are caught on camera. And then we'll uh, watch about four short deliverance videos. And at the end, we have a, a lady who was depressed. She started out with depression. And she wanted to kill herself in thoughts. She wouldn't say anything to anyone. And eventually that depression became mental illness. It just went from one level to the next to where she thought she was crazy. She thought no one loved her. She isolated herself from everyone. Would never <clears throat> give, give in to goodness, if you will. People would offer her to go to church, go everywhere. And finally, she came to the point where I might as well go because she made a deal with the devil that she would die. That lady, her, her testimony's on after she was delivered, how she came out of everything and her life came back together. Then the last one is about a gentleman who is stuck on pornography. He's a good guy all day long. And at night, he would get on the internet and he would drown himself in pornography. And that woman that would sleep with him after he would watch pornography was aimed to destroy everything. Took his church down, took his wife away, caused all of his kids to be on drugs. It destroyed this man's life. Just pornography. Enough is enough. Pornography is under whoredom and, uh, whoredom and uh, perversion. Now, who had the test? You had the, you had the, you already did yours. Anyone else? I'm going to run back and start this, this video. So if you want to, oh, here it is. It's ready to go. I get back here. I'll be right back. Start the first one. do the chair if you do the lights. Okay. Chris, could you grab the lights over there on the right, please? Thank you.
something no one else did. Today she smiles and plays with her toys as her mom recalls horror. You can see the drip marks kind of from the gas here too. Natasha Sullivan awoke at 1.30 a.m. Thursday to banging on their door. I came over here to see what's going on. My husband is on the phone filling up the buckets. And I'm like, oh boy, what's happening? Filling buckets with water because a strange man was outside dumping gasoline on their porch muttering as he moved. I heard the guy say that he's reporting for duty. And <laughs> so that was, I was a little shocked when I heard that. The stranger doused the door in the area around it. He threw away the building's fire extinguisher and pulled out a matchbox. I was under intention that it's about to blow up in a minute. So we're about to die. What do we do right now? He lit the matches and dropped several into the gas. But somehow nothing caught. No fire started. Moments later, police arrived and arrested a 25-year-old for attempted arson. They think he has mental health issues. I'm like, can't say it. Vika slept through the whole ordeal, but listen to this. The cool thing is she woke up in the morning, she didn't know what happened, and the uh, first thing she said, she had a dream that an angel was standing in her doorway. You know, she said that an angel was protecting us. That's all her innocent eyes saw. All her mom needs to know. I don't feel lucky, I feel blessed. I mean, everything happens for a reason. Even a frightening scene that somehow spared her family. Those are the moments that makes you believe in God. Charles Shelton put surveillance cameras around his house recently after a crime in the community started inching a little too close to his front door. He's out of town often, traveling to preach at churches, but August 4th, he caught something on one of those surveillance cameras. Now what I'm experiencing here at 346 is the angel of the Lord coming in. Something he is convinced was a sign from heaven. He says he was sitting here in this room watching the screens when he saw that white circle passed through the monitor. I think it's coming from this area first, then it goes in, and then it stays there for about maybe a good three to four seconds, and then it comes out. And then it comes into another, comes in at another direction. Shelton says God told him to wake up that morning and pray, so he did for about 30 minutes on his couch. Then he says something told him to go watch the monitors. But I never did look outside. Why and didn't you? It, well, it, I, I, it was just too astonishing. I mean, it just blew my mind. He says he knows there will be skeptics. Some of the people he's shown the video to told him it was probably a bug or light coming from nearby. He's even tried to recreate the image to come up with a more earthly explanation. But in the end, Shelton believes this white circle is a symbol of hope for a troubled community sent by a higher power. It changed me tremendously uh, to know that when I pray, the Lord hears my prayer. 
I know there's angels around that is being dispatched in this area. There are angels. Um, I think they really need to know that. Tuesday felt like any other day for the Graham family. Mary, Madeline, and Noah went to the subway on 122nd in Cicero in Alsip. Two-year-old Noah was eating. Then he started to struggle with a Dorito. I tried to give him a second to maybe fix that. And then he started to like turn blue. And he did like one big gasp for air. And then that was it. Then he like kind of stopped breathing and it looked like he was just gonna pass out. Graham panicked. She tried to pull Noah out of his stroller. I was more worried that I couldn't get him unbuckled. And if I can't get him unbuckled in another second, is it gonna be too late? And I don't know how he got him out, but he did. This man was at the counter getting ready to place an order. Mary's daughter, Madeline, ran to the front of the subway asking for help. He came over right away and he just took over, took my son straight out of that stroller, bent him over his leg, started, you know, pressure on his belly and patting him on his back. And then the lady that was sitting here started to yell that the baby was breathing, that he's screaming, he's, yeah. he's crying, he's okay. Noah had thrown up on the kind stranger. Graham rushed Noah to the bathroom to clean him up, and when she came back, that stranger was gone. He left? She's like, yeah, honey, he left. And I was like, oh, my God. I didn't even get to tell him thank you. I didn't, it's nothing. And then, you know, she had said, you know, some people are here for a reason, and, you know, not to worry about it too much, that he knew what he did. But still, I mean, that's my son. You know, he didn't find my wallet. He saved my son's life. Beautiful mass. It's, it is. It's amazing. Call it amazing grace that saved this Bible. I see my husband and um, our love. Rhonda Thompson's Bible. He um, knew me. Once her husband, Mike's. At his funeral, his Bible served as the guest book. So there's just page after page after page of these people's emotions. A book Rhonda carries to church every weekend putting it in the seat right next to her. But after church two weekends ago. So I just set the drink and the Bible up there. She left his Bible on top of her car. I went around, drove off. Two days later, trash duty brought KDOT worker Roddy Wright to the side of 56 Highway. But I didn't put two and two together that it was my old friend Mike's Bible. One of those days at work, trash became treasure for one of Mike's dearest friends. And you know, he was he was somebody that was there for me in a time in my life where I really needed somebody to hold on to. Once it sunk in that it was Rodney, of course it's Rodney. But God is definitely the one that put me there to find it. A story of amazing grace. Explain this stuff to me then, because this feels like Jesus Christ to me. Lost, but found again. No matter what, God just kept bringing it back together. In the name of Jesus Christ, come out of this body, all over your body, Holy Ghost, fire, every part of your body, Holy Ghost, fire in the name of Jesus Christ, why are you doing this to me now, my company would fall, every part of your body, we are going to get rid of all influences, will you not leave me alone? Right now, to you see it, the blood of Jesus Christ, go. We believe you have been inspired by the clip you have just watched. Blood of Jesus Christ, this, this, this demon caused her to be rich with the company, but everything else fell apart. Every part of your body. Look to her right shoulder, your left. In the name of Jesus Christ. Why are you doing this to me now? My company would fall. Every part of your body. No, we are going to get rid of all influence and demoniac. Will you not leave me alone? Right here. Continuing. Right now. The blood of Jesus Christ. Go. We believe you have been inspired by the clip you.
entire car is engulfed in flames. I, I could see the tires literally just melting on the ground. I didn't even know rubber melted that way. A horrific accident and miraculous survival. One of the police officers, they said, um, who else, who, how did he get out of the car? And I just, I said, Johnny. That's all I could remember. I said, Johnny got me out. A mysterious Good Samaritan whose actions defy reason. It had to be a miracle. Baffling first responders. There's only so much you can do when you have high voltage lines on a car. It was early spring 2015 in Columbus, Ohio. It was a, it's a great day, beautiful day. Pastor John Boston was driving on Airport Road when a car crossed into his lane. Oh, one fireman, he said, you didn't hit the pole, you went through the pole. A utility pole. The live transformer landed on John's vehicle. And so thousands of volts are running through the car. With his seat belt stuck and door jammed, all he could do is watch the searing and consuming heat. The windshield was melting, dripping, and the passenger window was fo folding into the car. Literally liquefying before his very eyes, as seen in this picture. I thought to myself, I'm not going to get out of here. But then a stranger appeared. He says a scruffy looking man who easily opened the smashed door. He reached in, he took me out. We walked maybe, maybe uh, 20 yards from the car. Just before the car exploded in flames. I can still see his eyes. I can still see his eyes. He said, what's your name? And I said, my name is John. And he said, well, I'm Johnny. The police are almost here. And I can't be here when they get here. But you're going to be OK. And with that, Johnny was gone while Pastor Boston was rushed to the hospital, where the questions began. That area never lost power, so no one should have ever been able to touch the car. And I shouldn't have survived. Potentially over 10,000 volts of electricity, stunning even veteran Columbus firefighters. Oh, I got goosebumps. With the transformer on the car, the car on fire, that's, that's probably one of the worst runs we could roll up on. It's uh, like a fireworks show. Immediately, people tried to rationalize what happened. Maybe the circuit breaker tripped and Johnny fled because he has a past. However, firefighters say breakers are designed to reset themselves and electricity was clearly coursing through the vehicle when help arrived. The person who touches that car, makes he, he's the ground. You'll be electrocuted. This video shows other cases of transformers blowing up, making rescue attempts extremely complicated. Holy! You're gonna have to jump away from the car and then shuffle your feet and, and follow those procedures, but that's still risky. But none of that happened with Pastor Boston leaving the young husband and father with only one conclusion. I don't think angels always come to us with wings and white robes and bright, bright shining lights. I think they come as help, and, um, and that's what I had that day. According to an Associated Press poll, 77% of Americans believe in angels. Encounters have been reported in the midst of many tragedies, from September 11th to tornadoes tearing across the Plain States. Pastor Boston says he doesn't care if people support him, but his heavenly encounter is already having an earthly impact. I am more sensitive to making a difference in people's lives in the city that I serve, and I want to be an angel for them. In Columbus, Suzanne Stratford, Fox 8 News. What this man saw as he was driving was enough to make him hit the brakes. Nobody will believe me if I didn't do this live, but I want you to look at this cloud in the sky. That's what I'm looking at right now. Look at this cloud in the sky. Is that not an angel or what? It sure does look like an angel. What's going through your mind when you see this? I was dumbstruck, I guess you could say. I was in shock. Uh, I'd never seen anything like it before uh, with my own two eyes. This is blowing my mind. As Corey Heron gazed at the image in the sky above South Carolina, he was struck with awe. Isn't that amazing? It's almost like you could literally see feathers, uh, a face, uh, you could make out some hands. Corey sat at the wheel of his car and just stared in disbelief. I don't even think it's moved. So is it a cloud formation or something much more meaningful? Corey says he knows the answer, no matter what anyone else might think. This is my angel. Look at this 
cloud in the sky. Is that not an angel Corey or what? Corey Heron took out his phone saying that he felt compelled to share what he was seeing. Not only that, he said that he was, it was a sign that came at the perfect time because he was struggling with his spirituality. God was telling him, I am still here. Medicine, can he dispatch? My dad just had a car fall on him and he can't breathe. 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 You can breathe now. I know it hurts, but you got to do it. Hey, hey, look at me. Look at me. Wow, an Idaho man lucky to be alive thanks to his quick-thinking sons. Stephen Parker was nearly crushed underneath his car when his 50-pound son jumped into action, miraculously using the jack to lift up the car. Now nine years old, J.T. Parker credits his strength to angels. And he joins me now along with his parents, Stephen and Jody, with this incredible story. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Stephen, tell us what happened on that day. We were working in the in the backyard trying to pull some axes off a car. I pulled the one axe off just fine, but the other axe wasn't coming off, so I went to reposition the car a bit, and the jack immediately fell on, suddenly fell on me. And my other, my older son, I went in the house to address a cut on his hand, so he wasn't there. But JT was there, and so I I couldn't breathe, but I had time to say one last word. My last word was to JT: Jack up the car quick. Wow, and JT, then, how did uh, J, JT? How did you know how to do that? Um, I. Just been working with my dad, so I see him do it all the time. Wow, so you just started jumping up and down on the jack, and the car slowly went up? Yes. And then that saved your dad's life, right? Yes. What do you think, what do you credit, what gave you the strength to do that? Angels. Angels did. Jody, where were you at the time? Um, I had actually left home to go pick up some cousins to come and play with my daughters. And then and, you came home? And then I came home to my older son on the phone with 911. Wow. Wow. So, Stephen, what happened? What type of injuries did you suffer? I suffered uh, 13 broken ribs was all I really suffered from the whole ordeal, which was amazing considering the car was crushed on me, smashing me. So. Do you feel like there was a miracle that happened here? Without a doubt, I know it was a miracle. Why? Because I should have been killed by it. My, my brother-in-law was there, and he see, he's seen accidents like this before, and he's, in both situations, they were fatal. You were and underneath the car. You would have been crushed underneath the car, and your young son was able to lift up a car, basically, by jumping up and down on the jack. Now, I understand, Jody, you tried. Your son went out to the garage later and tried a week later, and he wasn't able to do it? He did. We decided to go out there and see for ourselves, like, how much he knew about jacking up a car and how strong he really could be and wow. he tried as much as he could in fact for several minutes and he was not able to do it we're your gt well, thank you so much miracles still happen god bless you all we're glad you're alive Stephen. two powerful lights soar into the air as it this is so cool lost on 9-11 but look closer. There's an image atop the lights. Is this a trick of the light? Jesus, an angel, a cross? Beautiful, amazing. The man who took the photo says he was standing here on the waterfront in Hoboken, New Jersey, when he captured the heavenly image. It was 9.30 at night, and he was taking photos of the 9-11 memorial across the Hudson River. Some people think it's an unusual cloud formation. Others see a greater mystery. Rich McCormick took the photo. I didn't realize the image was there until I went back to my camera and saw, and I enlarged it a little bit. I said, what's that white light up there? And when I enlarged it and I kept enlarging it, I said, wow, this is amazing. Whatever it is, there's no denying this tribute in light is inspiring the world. He suffered a heart attack on the interstate and barely pulled over in time. No one came over to help until a guardian angel came to his rescue. Yeah, who was it? They to find that out, and they're asking for help in spreading the word. Bo Beer Paul was driving on I-79 North just 15 minutes from his home in Bridgeville when he suddenly realized he could go no further. I got a heart attack. He pulled off the highway just south of Cannonsburg, but was unable to call for help. The cell phone fell down. I was holding my sitting like that, and I got like a stroke, and I could not pick it up. I kept my window open, waving the hand for the people if they can stop by, help me. 
but people were flying at 80 miles. Although the cars did not stop, a man walking by the highway did. He picked up the cell phone from the floor. He called the 911. Within five minutes, the ambulance came. But the passerby who made the life-saving call had disappeared. I call him a guardian angel. He saved my life. My daughter, she's married. She lived in D.C. Paul Beer Paul met fellow heart patient Ted Cantoner during cardiac rehab. He was so passionate about telling me this story about this young fellow that had been walking along 79. I thought, you know, there's got to be something that, um, that I can do to try to find the guy. He tried social media with mixed results. I get a lot of feedback in terms of what a great story, but nobody's, nobody's found this guy. What would Balbeer say if he ever met the man who took the time to stop? Thank you, thank you, thank you, God bless. Thanking an unknown friend at the side of the road. Angels protect us. I mean, uh, I, 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 I know I wouldn't be here That's right true. this minute That's without true. an angel protecting me. Tell me about the time you had uterine cancer yes, and the healing angel. Yes, I was diagnosed. They told me I was only 28 years old. They told me I would have to have a hysterectomy. I wanted to marry. I wanted to have children. And I heard that Frances McNutt was in town. And so my friend and I went to a little home prayer group that night where he was praying. And I, I was seated in a chair, and he had his hand on my head praying for God to heal me. And there was only five or six of us there. And uh, I was sitting in the chair, and my head kept going back on the back of the chair. And uh, I felt like he was pressing too hard on my head. So I opened my eyes to ask him to not press so hard and he had moved. He was standing across the room with his arms held up praying and there was no one with a hen on my head. And so I knew it was an angel and I literally couldn't get out of the chair for a long time. I was held into the chair while God's healing power just went through my body. And the next day I went to the surgeon that was going to do the surgery over in Tampa right. and he examined me and he said, you've been totally and completely healed. There's no cancer. What was so wonderful to me about that story is we did marry later, and we have two amazingly wonderful children. Uh, very briefly, tell me about that sign you saw of the three angels so you knew you were supposed to uh, marry Francis. Well, we were at a retreat center because, you know, he, he, we both needed to hear it was God's will. And we were praying in a room together, and three angels came into the room while we were praying. And one of them leaned over next to him and said something to him. And I just knew that he had heard. Mm -hmm. And so I, when we finished praying, I said, did you hear? I didn't tell him about the angels. I said, did you hear? He said, no, not yet. And he went up to the chapel and got on his face before God. And he said, I'm not going to move until I know what I'm supposed to do. And then he heard it, that he was meant to marry and uh, to take me as his wife. The thought of having a guardian angel caring for you, regardless of what you look like, regardless of your imperfections, is a beautiful feeling. With that in mind, we're going to show you the five most amazing angels caught on camera. Now, some of these photos you might have seen, but we're going to give you the story behind these incredible photos. Bruce Van Matter loved trucks, and his job as a self-employed diesel mechanic helped this family man live out his truck dreams and provide for his wife and four children. He never gave a second thought to the danger of working on engines that weighed thousands of pounds until November the 16th, 2006. On that day, Bruce was just about to go home when he was asked if he could diagnose the problem on the truck. Just as Bruce slipped under the truck, the 20 ton capacity jack holding up the truck shot out from its position. This is what Bruce said happened next, and it's nothing less than a miracle. 
This 10,000 to 12,000 pounds of weight that is on these two front wheels on this axle came down across my midsection and just crushed me in half. Blood had splattered into my throat when it fell. The man who jacked the truck up, I begged him to get me out from underneath the truck. He didn't want to because he could tell that I had broken my back. And I did. The vertebrae in my spine were cracked. I tried to pull myself out from under the truck. It was the most incredible pain you can think of. I got myself just to the point where my head is sticking out from underneath the front bumper of the truck. The very next thing I just called out, Lord help me. I called it out twice. Instantly all of the pain left Bruce's body. At that point I became unconscious. My spirit left my body and floated into the ceiling and now my spirit is looking at the accident scene from above. The man I had been working with was on his knees above my body. I can hear him saying things like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but on each side of him also on their knees were huge angels. They would have been about 8 feet tall. They didn't have wings, just very, very broad shoulders. Between the two angels and him took up the whole truck. There was a bright light shining around each one of them. They were matching bookends. They didn't budge and I never heard them say anything. They just had their arms underneath the truck, but they were not holding the truck up. They had their arms angled in towards my body. There was no pain, just peace. I can't even describe the peace I felt in the ceiling up in the garage. Bruce was unconscious as he was flown on life flight to the hospital. Doctors there doubted he would even survive the next few hours. His ribs were broken, his pancreas and spleen crushed, and several major arteries had been severed. We found out from doctors later that at five places that major arteries were completely severed. I found out from doctors that there was a medical study done in 2001. According to that study, they can't find anyone else in the world that has ever lived with five major arteries being severed. I should have bled to death in a few minutes. So my thoughts is the angels were there to somehow hold me together. Bruce stayed in the hospital for over two months and survived five major surgeries, yet he had overwhelming obstacles to overcome. Almost 75% of his small intestines were crushed in the accident and had to be removed. Years later, Bruce is back to his normal weight and living a healthy life. He's now a full-time minister. This picture of what looks like to be of an angel was posted on Facebook on October 16th, 2014. The picture was taken in Lower Michigan. David was hunting when his camera that equipped with infrared motion detection sensors were set off. To his shock, he found this image. According to Ageless Knowledge, a photo store owner evaluated the photo of the angel and was unable to debunk the photo. The store owner claims that in the 25 years he has been in business, it is the coolest picture he has ever seen. The blue luminescent figure appears to float or hover above the grass against a background of evergreens. A hospice patient who sensed a presence in a room captured this amazing image of an angel. According to the report, a female hospice patient who was close to passing over reported sensing a presence lurking in the dark areas of her room. The woman was given a camera to attempt to capture what she was sensing. She reportedly captured the glowing image of an angel. Visions of angels and glimpses into the afterlife are common reports by those near death. Hospice workers who enter the field who are skeptics often change their minds after hearing hundreds of eerily similar deathbed reports. According to Trudy Harris, a hospice worker, deathbed visions are common in her line of work. She further concludes that people know when they are about to die. She says, No one has to tell them they are dying. They have developed what I call spiritual eyes and ears and seem to understand things in a way we cannot. Trudy says that when she first began working in a hospice, she thought that deathbed visions were mere hallucinations brought on by the body's reaction to the end of life. After 20 plus years of working in the field, she says she has heard the same stories over and over 
from the hundreds of patients she has cared for. The similarities in the stories have convinced Trudy Harris that deathbed visions are real. This picture was taken from an old reel or film that an architect by the name of Danny Sullivan paid just £15 for in a small British junk shop. Obviously, the junk shop owner did not know the vintage film contained images of an angel. In the dusty old trunk was a photo of an angel and some letters. The film itself appears to show angels forming a crucifix type shape in midair. The letters had belonged to a World War I soldier named William Doige. These letters were dated 1951 and revealed that William met an American World War II veteran who wrote to him saying they had seen the appearance of an angel before an accident that killed some of his fellow soldiers while training for D-Day landings. The soldier, who signed himself as Doug in a letter to Doge, told how his unit had been training in Ribchester Park in Gloucestershire in the spring of 1944. He described how a platoon bridge had collapsed under the weight of armoured vehicles killing more than 20 soldiers. Doug wrote that in the eve of the disaster, he and a friend named Chuck had seen an angel hover above where the man would later drown. He wrote, and I quote, the whole thing took on the shape of what I could only describe as an angel. I could see what looked like a long white robe. It had no feet and there were shapes like wings behind its shoulders. Chuck, the friend who witnessed the apparition along with Doug, died on Amhara Beach and took his visions of the story with him. But Doug's letter was enough for Doge to go camera in hand in search of the angel. It appears by what he captured on film and photograph that he was successful. No one knows what happened to Doge, but the letters he received, the film, the photograph and other personal belongings somehow ended up in an old trunk at a junk shop in England until Danny Sullivan discovered it and now was able to share it with all of you. You've probably all seen this photo, it's gone viral over the years, but I'm going to be telling you the story behind the photo, which some of you might not know about. It was a dark November night in 1988. Rose Benevito, who was 58 years old at the time, was driving in eastern New York State near the border with Connecticut. She had to swerve to avoid hitting a stray dog and the airbag inflated. She couldn't remember much after that. By the wreck of the car, which you can see by the photo, it's difficult to imagine that anyone could have survived, let alone survive without a scratch. But Benavita did exactly that. She is convinced she wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for divine intervention. It's a miracle I did survive. She claims she saw a guardian angel come to save her. Sharon Boo, a photographer from the Pauling Fire Department, captured the angel on camera. As a normal procedure, Sharon Boo photographed the wrecked car from several different angles, but there was only one photograph that the unexplainable figure appeared. Sharon Boo said, I have taken hundreds and hundreds of photographs and I have never come across anything like this. The photograph contains a figure. You can see through the figure and still see the automobile. Both Boo and Benavita believe that the image in the photograph is an angel who saved Bonavito's life. Boo said, I feel she had an angel looking over her shoulder. Some believe the image is simply a photo trick or something Boo created when she developed the film. But Boo does not do her own film developing. I do not develop my own photographs, she said. I take them to a one hour developing photograph company. That way they can develop right away. The photograph has been looked at by three experts. There is no trace of any deception. The angel appears to also be on the negative of the film. Benavita said, if someone says that this is a hoax, I will have to strongly disagree with them. I am here and I'll survive the accident without injury. To top this, there is also proof in the photograph as well. Please give this video a like and subscribe if you enjoyed watching this video. Also, we have another
I cannot see during many years. She cannot see. No puedo no ver. ver bien, no veo de lejos, no I cannot see for 16 years. For 16 years. She cannot see. For 16 years. As she fell to the floor, the man of God drew near and touched her once again, and the Holy Spirit completed the miracle. See her reaction as she realizes what God has done for her. I am free! Hallelujah! Yo puedo ver! I can see! I can see! Oh, puedo ver! Hallelujah! Jesucristo por mi salvación. Hoy soy libre por el poder del Espíritu Santo. Puedo ver, puedo ver de lejos. Puedo ver que está de México con Tim y Joshua. Emmanuel TV. She has just said that she can read the words on the T-shirt. Cruzada en México okay. con Tim y Joshua. Cruzada en México con Tim y Joshua. Puedo ver, puedo leer, puedo ver, puedo ver. Antes no podía ver. She said before she could not see. Now she can see. Now she can read the words on the T-shirt that clearly says, Cruzada en México con TV Joshua. 15 años tuve, no podía ver de lejos, no distinguía a la gente. She said for 15 years she has not been able to see, she has not been able to distinguish people. Now able to clearly see the people standing around her, she begins to shake their hands to prove to those watching her that her sight has truly been restored. Can you imagine that this young lady had been losing her sight for over 16 years? And yet, here she is walking all by herself. Let's hear what happened to her. My name is Yareli Dominguez Garcia. Vengo de Tehuacán, Puebla, México, y la persona que está enseguida de mí es mi madre. Ella es Juana García Soriano. My name is Yareli Dominguez García. I come from Tehuacán, Puebla, Mexico, and the person next to me is my mom, Juanita García. El problema que yo tenía es que durante 16 años tuve un, tuve problemas para ver bien. No distinguía rasgos de personas. No no distinguía a las personas de lejos, no podía ver su apariencia, era pura, prácticamente pura silueta. The reason that brought me to uh, Prophet TV Joshua Crusade in Mexico is because of my short sight. I had a blurry vision, I couldn't see, I need assistance, and that was a cause more than of 16 years. Ok, eh, yo no podía eh, distinguir nada de cerca, eh, necesitaba lentes, no podría observar, no podía ver bien la computadora. A las personas que tenía a mi lado era necesario que me asistieran en el caso de eh, poder distinguir anuncios, eh, letreros o para distinguir a personas. Um, I would need assistance from people to help me out to read uh, notes, letters, uh, flashcards, posters, um, because I, I needed glasses. I had blurry vision. Tenía miopía, astigmatismo, infección. Eh, de modo que tenía que ser controlado por medicamentos, por pomadas eh, y para llegar a tener una sanidad o obtenerla era necesaria una cirugía o una operación pero como mi miopía era alta ya no la podía alcanzar para lograr ver bien. Yeah, the doctor said that I was going to need an operation because of the opia and infection a lot of bacteria a, a lot of um there that is was inside my eyes so that was uh, the reason that i couldn't see it as well cuando el profeta tv joshua eh, comienza a golpear mis ojos eh, yo eh, sentí una fuerza mayor en mí que era lo que lo, lo que hacía que, que no quería recibir la oración por parte del profeta tv joshua que no era mi no era yo sino el mismo espíritu que se estaba manifestando eh, en ese momento yo no tenía control ni de mi boca ni de mi cuerpo, sino era algo mayor. Cuando el profeta TV Joshua da el último golpe, 
yo siento como eso sale y cuando yo me, des, me levanto, yo me siento ligera. Cuando me siento ligera, yo en ese momento pude ver claramente las pantallas, las personas, la gente que estaba alrededor mío, aún las personas que estaban a, a los lados, las veía, eh, las veo, las, la, las vi claramente. En ese momento yo comienzo, yo comienzo a gritar que soy libre, que soy libre. See, when the man of God, Prophet T.B. Joshua, got near me and he prayed for me, I felt like a strong punch that just, you know, took all the unclean spirits that were inside of me because at that moment, you know, I don't remember anything. I didn't see anything very clear uh, uh, precisely because of that unclean spirit, that, that demonic force that was inside me, you know, that was strong, that couldn't allow me to act upon my own self. And at that moment, you know, then I feel like something just leaves at of my body I feel very light I, I feel you know like if something just came upon me and gave me a, a, a better vision and then you know uh, at that moment I arise you know and then I start seeing clearly I start you know saying that I'm, I'm free I'm free and you know that that was a very uh, happy moment in my life as well and Jesus Christ turning out of his followers to change the world today. Distance is not a barrier to God's will. Emmanuel TV. God with us. What's your name? Esther. What, what happened to you? My, my hand is like as if I want to collect something. But you don't know what is wrong with you? I, I don't understand. You, you, are you once mentor? Yes. Now, how are you feeling now? I feel okay. Who is this man? Oh, yeah, this one is my daddy. It's your dad. <laughs> what class are you before I'm you? In SS2. Before you became mentor? <laughs> yes. SS2. Now you are normal now. Who I am? We are two puppets, Mr. Joshua. Thank you. Et donc, c'est monsieur, regardez votre écran. Voilà, c'est jeune fille qui souffre de deux hommes. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Jesus Christ. My daughter is free. We are free indeed. Thank you, Jesus. Here is Prophet T.B. Joshua praying for the people in the name of Jesus Christ. He encounters this lady and the power of God exposes whatever that is not of God in her life. Let's see how she was delivered. You want what? You want what? You want what? Okay. What's it at her? What's it at her career, her family? Speak! Yeah? Speak loud, you demon. You speak the family. Okay, how many are you in this body? Eh? Okay, who is number one? Number one? Number one! Death. Number two? Spirit of what? Speak out! Okay, see this man. Who is this man to you? She married him. Who are you in this body? Speak out! Eh? 
Eh? Amen. You're a man. Okay, what can you say about your wife? This is my wife. Um, she's just been struggling. I can, I can tell that she's been afflicted for quite a while. Yeah. Okay, who is the cause of the troubles in the marriage? Speak out! Who is the cause of her troubles? You're the cause. How long have you been in her? Okay, how did you enter her? How did you enter her? How did you enter her? In the dream. In the dream. What do you do? Prophet T.B. Joshua offers spirit-filled prayer to her. And the evil spirit flees at the mention of the name Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. She is free in Jesus' name. Emmanuel, my name is Danielle Amy and I am from Australia. And the man beside me is my lovely husband, Trevor. Well, you're both very welcome all the way from Australia. You've really come a long way. And, um, well, the Holy Spirit is a rewarder. And you've been delivered, as we saw on the screen. And we want to hear from you about how those evil spirits have been affecting your life. So please go ahead with your testimony. Um, what brought me to the synagogue church of all nations was I had been struggling with my health and had been diagnosed with several autoimmune um, diseases and disorders. Um, and my family members are quite sick and I was looking around at them and I just believed that God had more for myself and God had more for my family and I wasn't going to take no for an answer. So we applied to come to SCOME um, to receive healing and de deliverance. Our sister mentioned that she came not only due to the evil attack she was facing, but also because she had some eating disorders and allergies that have been affecting her life. So please go ahead and let us know how these problems had affected you. Um, Autoimmune is where the body attacks itself, so I was constantly being diagnosed with different problems in with my, uh, within my body because my body kept on attacking different areas. Um, and it just was exhausting. I would spend the majority of my time at home by myself or in bed because I was just beyond exhausted. Um, but the Lord has healed me. And I haven't taken any of the medication that I usually take on a daily basis since the deliverance and healing. Um, and I feel a lot better. I have a lot more energy. Thank Let's you. put our hands together for Jesus. So you mentioned that you were having some different problems health-wise, but it was as a result of the evil attacks you had been facing. And um, you mentioned that you went to the doctors and they kept diagnosing different problems with you. Can you explain more about the evil attacks you experienced and how they affected you? Um, I've been having evil attacks. Well, the first one that I remember was when I was about five or six years of age. Um, and I've been having them throughout my entire life, either in dreams or visions, um, but often in the physical. Um, sometimes I would just wake up uh, from my sleep and I would have bruises around my, necks, uh, my neck from strang strangle marks. Um, I'd have bites on my body um, in places that I wouldn't be able to reach to bite myself. Um, and I um, would have bruises and scratches over me, um, and I would have evil spirits come and visit me and speak to me um, like I'm awake now. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned that when you woke up, you would physically see bruises and scratches on your body in places that you couldn't reach yourself. Uh, letting you know that something else had been doing these things to you. Yes, that's correct. Did you ever explain these things to the doctors in Australia? No. Um, 
I actually felt quite ashamed and isolated. There's very few people that I would actually share this with because um, I guess culturally it's very different in Australia. Um, and if I ever told the doctor how I got the bruises or some of the injuries that I had sustained, um, which actually led to me being hospitalised, I was fearful that I would be institutionalised because they'd think I was insane. Uh, did you explain any of these things to your husband? Uh, yes, I did, but he began to um, encounter them for himself. He was a witness after we got married. He's, yeah. Okay, and you mentioned that you would also see them physically, not just in the dream. Can you give us an instance of where this happened to you? Um, I had one night just after we got married. Um, I wasn't able to sleep, so I went into another room to lay down. And I fell asleep and I had a dream that there were three beings standing in my room and they were talking about how I was going to die, that I um, was going to be involved in a car accident, but it wasn't the car accident that was going to kill me. It was a ruptured artery that was going to kill me. Um, I woke up out of the dream and because I heard talking and when I woke up, I saw, physically saw the three beings standing um, before me. Can you describe what you saw standing before you? They were tall and dark um, in appearance, but I saw like shimmering green, like it was, they had green coats or cape on or something, but it was very dark in the room. And the room was very cold and I just felt the only way to describe it is just death. Um, and so I called my husband and he came in and commented that was something was wrong before he even said to him what had happened. Um, and we began to pray. We both got up, um, we both went into our dining lounge area and we had a big bookcase and on top of the bookcase was a candle. We had several candles. And one of the candles had been taken down and put it on the kitchen bench. And burning in the candle was a green flame. Neither my husband or I had touched the candle. Neither of us had brought it down or lit the flame. And we just felt such an evil presence in the house. You mentioned just before that uh, the three beings were standing there and you, you heard them discussing a plan of how to kill you. But your husband walked in and said, something's not right. Did he see the beings as well at that time? No, he didn't. Um, and so after praying together, we went back to bed um, together and I was laying there awake and my husband fell asleep. And while I was laying there, um, this being came over me and began to scream violently in my face. And my husband woke up out of his sleep, rebuking in Jesus' name. And he turned to me saying that, um, describing what he had just seen, what had just happened in his dream. But what he had saw in his dream was exactly what I was, had witnessed being awake as I lay. Well, so what you experience physically, a demon shouting over your head, your husband as he was sleeping, he saw it happen too, but woke up rebuking this demon in Jesus' name. Yes, that's correct. So what happened after that? Um, so at the time I wasn't working because I was quite unwell. Um, and I had a friend that was also unwell and I wanted to cook food for her and her family. So I made food, um, put it in the car to go. And then um, as I was driving, I went to turn down the street um, to her house. And out of nowhere, a car came and hit me and totaled the car that I was in. Um, and I hit my head and hurt my neck 
but I didn't want to go to hospital, um, so I just went home, and my husband came home to be with me. Um, and as I was laying on the couch, because I was in quite a bit of pain, I then saw a tiger come, and it bit me on the neck. I was in excruciating pain, and I couldn't move. Um, my heart was not beating properly, and I had um, pain down my arms. So I was admitted into hospital, um, into emergency, and... Okay, sorry, we just want to um, get something cleared from you. You mentioned that after having that strange encounter that day of uh, listening to evil beings explaining how they planned to kill you in a car crash and would affect your neck, and then the very same day as you were in your car on your way to drop some food to a sick friend, you had the car accident, then went home and you said a tiger came in and bit your neck. Had you slept off at that time when you saw a tiger come in? Or can you make it clear for us? Was that physically? Yes, that was physically. I hadn't been asleep. Um, yeah, the only way to describe it is like uh, when you have fire and there's smoke. Well, it was the same density and texture, but very clear and there was colors um, and it came and bit me. So the tiger physically came into where you were? Yes, it did. Yep. So what happened after you went to the hospital? Um, I was admitted for, I think it was five days in intensive care. They weren't able to find out what the problem was. Um, and I was in such bad pain, I couldn't get out of the bed to go to the bathroom or anything. Um, and they couldn't relieve the pain, so they accidentally knocked me um, with too much um, pain relievers. And I ended up going catatonic and unresponsive for a period. Um, but just before that happened, um, on the, one of the injections they gave me, again I saw the tiger come and bite me. Um, and then eventually um, they ended up find, doing a, I think it was an MRI scan, and they found that the muscles around my artery on my neck were being constricted and they were concerned that it was going to cause a stroke. They couldn't work out what was causing it. Okay, so the doctors couldn't understand what was happening to you, and you mentioned they gave you so much medication that you were comp your whole body became unresponsive, and you were in a critical condition. Yes, that's correct, because at first I was showing no signs at all that the medication was affecting me negatively or positively. Um, and so there was a build-up in my system, and it ended up just hitting me in one go. For the so sake of time... Point, you realized that your problem had gone beyond... Human for the sake of time, I'm going to skip ahead. She was completely free from 11 demons entering her during her sleep in a dream. When you read your Bible and apply the blood of Jesus over your mind, it blankets your mind, and you have to keep it up and keep it up and keep it up and keep it up until those demons are tired of trying to fight through that protective blanket to get to you. This particular gentleman, I am this particular gentleman has battled with sexual immorality and it will bless every person in the room. Olushola of Chapel of Exploit International. Um, I was one of the pastors that used to pass a lot of blasphemous comments on the prophet of God. Uh, Prophet T.B. Joshua, uh, especially when I was in my former ministry, my general overseers make us to believe that the man of God is not genuine, and often there is a lot of blasphemous comments he used to pass on him, and made us also to believe and pass the same. 
uh, not until I was watching the Emmanuel TV that I could see that the man of God is not what we thought he is that I have to ask God to forgive me that this is not the man that we think he is look forget about whatever comment you said about me what is your problem But the real problem that really brought me here was I was a victim of internet, most especially the area of pornography. Before I came to the, the Lord, that was one of my major problems. But since I came to the Lord, I determined that I'm not going to that way again. But during the browsing on internet and this pornography interject, interjection I was again caught in the trap that I, the spirit no, no, that the spirit is still there so I began to patronize start buying cassettes, you know watching all these things again watching all this pornography again and it got to a time before I knew what was happening that I began to see the image of those Things I watch coming physically to come and meet me, even when I'm in my sitting room, that now I should come inside and we should come and have fun. And I didn't have control over myself. I would find myself being in my room and making fun with this with image. And this thing was so much that it disorganized everything about me, the ministry, the family. The finance I try on my own to deliver myself go to several fasting no way I have gone to for deliverance several places, no way until when I was listening to one of the people that were given testimony on the internet that he has similar problem and when he came to the man of God he was free then I told myself I said let me try and come here too and receive deliverance to my surprise those spirits they told me not to come but I defied their instruction. I started coming. How did the spirit talk to you? How did they tell you not to come? They used to speak as if a woman being is talking to somebody. And only me will see them. In fact, when I, when I defied their instruction and I started coming here, they were following me and telling me that go back. Go back. But something was pushing me. I remember when man of God was playing on, praying on the TV. And he was praying for those outside there. That is where my deliverance began. As he prayed and said, receive your deliverance. I was surprised in the front of my television. I fell under the anointing. Right in my room, in my house, as I was watching, I fell under the anointing. That was where my, I said, I will go there. And they would say, I should not go. As I said, come here, they were following me. But when I was almost getting to Synagogue Church of All Nations here, I just saw them, they just ran back. And I started feeling free. So please, man of God, I want you to deliver me completely and help me out. Amen. Come. Check this out. Escuchamos la confesión de este hombre que también es pastor. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> ah, you cannot get this one out of my hand. You cannot get this one. <laughs> ah! Ah! Out! Regardez votre écran. Cet homme est sous la délivrance du Saint-Esprit. 
se dit d'être un pasteur parmi ceux qui ont blasphémé contre l'homme de Dieu avant de venir à la synagogue. Il dit, le problème qu'il a emmené ici, c'est le problème d'Internet. Avant qu'il ne devienne un pasteur, il regardait beaucoup de pornographie. Il a dit, pendant qu'il était pasteur, il a touché à Internet et la pornographie est venue à l'écran, ce qui a révélé en lui encore le désir d'avoir des rapports sexuels. Il a commencé à avoir, aller de femme en femme à nouveau, regarder des films pornographiques, ce qui a affecté son ministère. In the name of Jesus Christ. Escuchamos la confesión de este hombre que dice que, que era uno de los blasfemadores en contra del hombre de Dios, pero su problema real era la pornografía a través del Internet. Eso es. Es Which area are you called to heal people, preach this gospel message of God and heal, or you are called to prophesy or to deliver the word of wisdom? What area? Because the problem we are facing now, we know we are called, but what area? We don't know. When God calls us, He makes us fit. So I don't want us to blaspheme. Begin to look at the minister. Ah, this man is a pastor. Why this thing happen to him? Does it mean that he is not called? Does it mean that he is not a man of God? No. He has gone beyond his boundary. When you are called to carry certain thing, like I have said, the law will make you fit. In the process of carrying that thing, whatever happened. Even if you pass through the valley of shadow of death, he will see you through. Mm. You are free now. Just give me my give us just a two minutes message. Okay? Because those messages that have disappeared have come back. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I am speaking from Psalm 126. Verse 1 says, When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. The only one that can bring anyone out of captivity is the Lord himself. Captivity is real. But the Lord is more real. Amen. <laughs> Satan is a liar. Satan thought he has finished. Hallelujah. What a privilege. What a glorious God. What a, what a lovely Evelyn Father. Oh, Jesus, you are good. You are good. I am restored. What the enemy didn't want to happen in my life, it has happened at last. That I will stand before the whole world and preach the gospel of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. I am like a prodigal son yes. whom his father have mercy on him yes. that when he decided to come out his father opened his hand I said my son come in I will not make you a slave you still remain a son Woo. when we repent and turn away from our sin and come back to God he's ready to restore us back yes. to the original purpose he had for us in the beginning the purpose of God stand forever. Devil may fight it. Principality may attack it. They may want to nullify it. But God says, I will make my purpose to come to pass. He said in the book of Jeremiah 29, 11. He said, I know the thought that I have towards you. The thought for good and not for evil. To bring you an expected hand. The expected hand of God 
is certain. No devil can cancel it. He may fight it. But God at the hand. God at the hand. We glorify himself. Devil may be fast. But God is faster than the devil. So I am encouraging you. Wherever you are. I have almost lost hope. There are some times I look at my life. I say it's better one commit suicide. But one voice will say, it is not yet over. Oh. I thank God today. Amen. God glorify himself. Do you see him talking like somebody who is possessed? No. No. Your spirit will tell you now that it's free. There is no guilt there again. No condemnation. You see, it's almost, almost lost hope. Listen to him. He's crying. Freedom. I am grateful to God. I have found a father. <laughs> but I know no hope is lost in Jesus. Because the Bible says, Jesus, our hope of glory. Yes. Any glory that has been lost, as long as one can still be connected to Jesus, that hope will be restored Hallelujah. i have almost lost all hope i knew i have ministry but everything has scattered there is nothing i could do but i thank god that today my hope is restored Hallelujah. the me that came here Come is on. not the me that is standing now hmm. certain fire hmm. has entered into me i have fire to run now yes. i have fire what has been destroying me before I have fire to destroy them now. Hallelujah. Satan, you are in trouble. Amen. Principalities, you are in trouble. Demons, you are in trouble. Hallelujah. We will cross you into pieces. Woo. What you have done, we will give it to you a trillion times in destruction. Woo. Glory be to Jesus. Hallelujah. I am grateful, Daddy. Oh. Thank you. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Oh, well, this is exactly what the Lord has actually designed up for. We, pastor, pastor too can have problem, but pastor will be the one to deliver pastor. See? But today, there is nothing like that again. See? This is what we are born for, we are created for, and we are to live for, See? and we are to die for. Now it is time to continue the journey. Damn! Woo! You may be seated. We believe that you have been inspired. Let's pray the deliverance prayer and be on our way. Thank you, Heavenly Father. You are a God of mercy and a God of grace. An ever-present help in time of need. Stand to your feet, please. Everyone in here and everyone in here. Everyone in here. All of you. I love to see people delivered. No matter who they are. Everyone on this earth. Everyone on this earth. Needs to get the devil off their back. Or they will never see heaven. They will only be saved in their head and they'll be speaking to the air when they pray. When you're saved in your heart, you read your Bible because you want to, not because you have to. You're in love with the Lord and every time you open up this Bible, the devil runs from you. It brings miracle after miracle after miracle. In Jesus' mighty name, I command every foul spirit to leave these good people alone. I command you out, out of their lives and off of this property. I don't care who you think you have a hold of in their family or at their job or in their finances. I command you out in Jesus' name. Now, I want every one of you to command the enemy out of your life. Repeat after me. I command every foul spirit to get out of my life. Speak it with authority. I command every foul spirit 
to get out of my life. Now, you have no place. You have no place. You have been replaced with the power, the presence, and the Holy Spirit of God. I belong to Jesus Christ. I command you out, you foul spirits. Get out and stay out in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I apply the blood of Jesus, the fire of the Holy Spirit, the fire of that Holy Ghost, the fire of the Holy Ghost, the fire of the Holy Ghost, the fire of the Holy Ghost on every precious person that steps foot on this property, and especially those that honor you, respect you enough to come to a deliverance service. God bless them, Lord. Dump the blessings on them. Multiply them in every area they lack. In Jesus' mighty name, Father, I know you're a God of miracles and you're a God of grace. You're an ever-present help in time of need. And I beg of you, Father, have mercy, mercy, mercy on them. Teach them the value of reading their Bible. Teach them the value of prayer. And let every single person that steps foot on this property understand that they must be totally delivered to make it to heaven. Totally delivered and they can read their Bible all by themselves and do it. But we are here to help them. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. We love you, we worship you, we honor you. And I want everyone in here to repeat after me, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross for me and rose again the third day. Holy Spirit, if there is anything in my life that should not be there, get it out and add what should. Cleanse me. Purify me. Deliver me from all evil. Set me free. And write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And help my loved ones make it to heaven too. In Jesus' mighty, powerful name, amen.